today is going to be the uh, starting of the ball rolling, I guess, in preparation for Easter. So we're just basically going to go over a few things. You might have heard them before. I guess I could say the purpose of this, I don't know that I'd necessarily call it a sermon, but we'll call it that, um, is to show the intentionality of God and everything that he does. Uh, he does nothing, we all know this, but he does nothing without a purpose. And if you sat and really thought about that, that's kind of mind-blowing. It, it includes, you know, the weather, the wind, children being made, us being created. Everything has a very specific purpose, including his relationship that he has with us. And uh, if you guys recall, and I know you guys have all, most of you have read it, uh, we are often told that Jesus was in Jerusalem when he was riding on the donkey, and he really wasn't. He was on his way to Jerusalem. Um, everything that we see depicted in the movies uh, is in Jerusalem, and he was not in Jerusalem when he was on the donkey and the palms were laid down on the ground. And it was leading up to Jerusalem. Uh, and it all starts prior to that uh, when God, uh, when God, well, he is God, yes, in, in fleshly form, uh, when Jesus was in Jericho. And he had done some works there, and they had been witnessed by people. And as Jesus was traveling to Jerusalem, those people, some of them decided to continue to follow him. And so there was a, there was a history that these people had with Jesus. They kind of already knew that he was a great person and that things happened around him. And there was one particular gentleman, and I can never say his name correct. It starts with a B, so I won't even try to say it. Who, who lifted him up uh, verbally. He, he spoke of the great things he was doing. And because of that man, the, the word of who Jesus was spread a little bit farther. So as Jesus was heading to Jerusalem for this time and the event that was going to occur, there was an entourage, as we call it now, of people following him who, who kind of already knew who he was. And uh, that's the reason why when the specific donkey was acquired, it was able to happen the way it was. And again, speaking of intentionality, and if I recall correctly, Dave was the one that perked up when I spoke on this last. Um, the gentlemen were told, go here and get this specific donkey and its colt and bring them. And nothing will come of it, and there won't be any problems. And my question back then when I spoke on it before was, why would somebody willingly hand over their donkey and its colt without a question Sure, no problem. Here you go. When somebody says, we're here to pick up a donkey and a colt, it's in need, it's needed for service. And they just handed it over, no questions asked. And Dave's resounding response was, because God had spoken to them. Because God had laid a plan. That's the intentionality. The, the event hadn't even occurred they weren't even there yet. There was a donkey and a colt waiting, ready to go. And when it came time and they came and said, we need your donkey and your colt, it's in need and it is of a service. What they were actually saying is this donkey and colt are needed to service the Lord. Those words that they had uttered to the owner of the donkey actually meant that in translation. And... It's amazing to me that we walk through life and do so many things because they're second nature. There's a purpose for what we're doing. There's a reason why we get out of bed and we start our day and we get dressed and we go about our day 
and fulfill our jobs, go to the grocery store, cook our meals. It's all for a reason, but we're so used to doing it often, we forget the intent of what we're doing and why. And in this story leading up to Jerusalem, God shows his intentionality in this situation especially, and he wanted to place everything on a pedestal but in certain moments in the story shine a spotlight on the pedestal of what was occurring now mind you what i'm talking about is spoken of in all the gospels and it would be matthew 21 1 through 10, 11 in mark 11 1 through 10 luke 19 28 through 38 and John 12, 12 through 18. That's just some of the, the scriptures. The donkey was chosen for a reason. Not a horse, but a donkey. And we all know that the donkey was chosen because it was a, a beast of peace. That in the culture at that time and throughout time, a horse is seen as... A, a mount that signified war. So I'm going to point out something now that in, in the moment that Jesus is riding towards Jerusalem on the donkey, there's something that's contradictory culturally, and it's done very intentionally. So we know Jesus is riding on a, col uh, on a, a donkey with its colt, and we're going to Jerusalem, and these people have followed him. And that's when they start to sing the praises. And if we remember, Hosanna is not just a normal word. When we sing Hosanna, we are singing to the top of the heavens, to the highest spot of God's realm, saying, here we are to worship with our Lord, worship with us, highest, oh, highest heaven. That's what Hosanna means uh, in a word picture form, I guess you could say. So they start to sing, and in the commentary that I read, they were about a mile away from the edge of Jerusalem when this, this singing occurred. And it, in our modern times, would be the equivalent of hearing a Super Bowl party from a mile away. These people were, were loud, they were proud, they were happy, and they were praising their Lord. And Jerusalem could hear it. And those that didn't agree with what they were doing kind of got in an uproar over what they were hearing. A lot of the time we, in stories and, and things, are told that they're in Jerusalem again doing this and then everybody in Jerusalem hears them and gets in. No, they were not even in Jerusalem yet when this started. So that's how on fire they were and excited and willing uh, to, to sing their, their praises. When the palms were laid down on the ground, there's multiple things happening there. And as Curtis always likes to say to me when we have our meetings, and we haven't had one in forever, God doesn't always use, do something for just one purpose. There's usually more than one purpose. It's a dual meaning. Sometimes it even has three meanings or more. The, the palms on the ground were to, one, give Jesus a clean place to walk on because, as we know, there were no paved roads back then. It was, it was dusty, uh, generally speaking, and dirty. You know, it's where animals of beasts of burden defecated on their way to the market. And people threw their wash water and all manner of other things in the streets. I mean, that's just the way it was. And so laying the palms down was to give him a soft, clean surface to travel on. But those palms meant something to the Egyptian culture. Palm leaves are a, a, a visual reference to the Egyptian culture of victory over a battle. So here we have Jesus on a donkey, which is a, 
a beast of peace. But yet with the palms, God is stating, I am victorious. And I'm riding in victory, even though he's on a donkey of peace. So God very intentionally, culturally speaking back in that time, was showing the people very specifically who Jesus was and what he was there to do. He was, he was going to be victorious as he walked in. Now, it also says that uh, they also laid down clothes. And many believe, many commentators believe that that was because they literally stripped the area of vegetation of the palm leaves, and they had no more. And so they continued to lay their cloaks and such down to, again, give Jesus a soft, clean footing to travel on. And Egyptians would wear the palm symbol in pins and jewelry um, to show that they were victorious whenever they won a battle. It was part of the garment that they would wear. And so for palm leaves to be used, like I said, it's a visual representation of what God had in store. And the culture there knew it. And so he wasn't just doing a simple trek on a donkey up to Jerusalem. He was, you know, riding on those palm leaves. And it was a statement that now you can see kind of from their cultural perspective why some of them were angry. Because he was stating that he was higher than just the man on the donkey. You know, the, the, he's, the, he's God's son. He's the king. And a lot of people weren't happy that he was saying that. The actions that God took to get the donkey, but especially in leading up to, to Jerusalem, riding the donkey and its colt, and uh, the specific type of donkey that he chose, uh, they believe historians and, and um, the, I think you, I guess you could say Egyptologists and, and this kind of thing, and, and the, the gentlemen that, and ladies that write the commentaries, they believe, and I cannot remember and I cannot find it, the type of donkey that he rode in on was a very specific breed. They don't look like the ones you and I are used to seeing in the Grand Canyon and that kind of thing. They have a fuzzy look to them. Also looks like peach fuzz, their hair does. And they're, they look fluffy. And they were the, uh, the breed that was used when kings and the like would be traveling. And they wanted to prove that they were coming in in peace and not in war. That was the kind they used. And they were on an island, if I remember correctly, or some very uh, secluded spot. They're the cutest most beautiful thing. They almost look like a fake stuffed donkey. I can't even put it any other way. They're just, they're absolutely beautiful and their, their uh, coat shines in the sun. It's beautiful. Um, what I want to point out, again with the intentionality, is how far God will go ahead of time to set the way for what he intends, not just for Jesus to do in that time, in that story, but for each and every one of us. There's things that have been set into place for us in our futures that we don't even know about yet because we haven't been there yet because God's everywhere, past, present, and future. And God is making a way for us intentionally in that same manner that he did for Jesus. He uses us in that same way he used Jesus on that very specific donkey. He uses Jesus' followers in that time when they pulled those palm leaves down and they laid their garments down on the ground. He uses people around us to do that exact same thing for us. So what vehicle do we ride in on? What is our mode of transportation? And speaking of transportation, nowhere else does it talk about Jesus riding on anything. Yes, he travels in a boat, but nowhere else does it talk about Jesus riding a mount. So he really stepped out of his normal mode of transportation to do it. And that's 
another reason that I, I, my dad and I decided to use the word intentional. There's a reason for it that's just deeper than Jesus needed to get to Jerusalem, so he decided to ride on a donkey. That man was used to walking everywhere. It was, it was a normal thing for him. So now I guess, um, since I have the wireless, we can't pass it around. So I will just walk around with the wireless and talk at the same time. Uh, to you guys, what are the intentional things that Jesus does in the, the time of year leading up to Easter, during the Easter season? What are the intentional things that have touched you regarding that? Mr. Miller. The seriousness and the gravity of what God gave through Jesus in this we have a life taken but for that life that is taken through death we have our lives it is the fact that such a complete prepared and planned process is what separates us from our death God's intentionality but the giving of life, that gives me chills when I think of it, and I get goosebumps to realize that God took care of that at the highest level that we can understand and relate to. Very true. It, also, it reminds us, too, that God did this intentionally at the foundation of the world or before it even that Christ would come and die for us so that's intentional oh yes very very it was intentional that he in fact uh, gave himself up he didn't have to but he gave himself up for us yeah. it's very true I mean thinking even now if that had not happened, and it happened now, is there really any other sacrifice that could be given? Nope, not on our lives. Ha! Huh. Tongue in cheek, but very true. Very, very true. I mean, to think of it, if the whole of humanity was sacrificed right now, it's still not enough. Yet one man covered it all. I mean, the volume of the grace and mercy that was housed in that one man is enough to cover humanity that has been, is, and will be. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I want to make sure I, I say that so that the, the recording can hear. It's almost impossible for our brains to get around and wrap our minds around the fact that, that how did you word it? That he gave that one sacrifice for everybody. The magnitude of that is huge. And... All the songs that we sang today, they, they kind of go for me. There were spots in, I think, every single song that, that was bringing so much to my mind, the things that uh, people have been asking me. I know I had somebody ask me recently, you say you love Jesus and that he does great works, but I've prayed to him my whole life for healing of this thing that this person had and I have suffered with it and I still suffer with it today how do I believe in somebody that doesn't want to heal me and I, I said who said he doesn't want you healed 
Nobody said he doesn't want you healed. He didn't say he doesn't want you healed. He actually says he does want you healed. So he says the opposite of that in the Bible. And secondly, just because you're not healed the way you wish you were does not mean that good will not come of it. If good can come from the death of his son, then good can come from your struggle. It's a matter of looking at it differently. And that's what God does. God looks at everything intentionally and differently. All right, okay, don't confuse me. Eileen. Every time, this is for me. Every time I'm around someone who is deathly ill, has a problem, it's not always they're not going to be healed, right? Like you said, it's something for one of us or all of us to learn from what that person's going through. Um, for years, you know, Mr. Miller being ill, it's like, is it ever going to stop? When is it going to stop? He knows your mercy, your grace. And every time he goes in, they find out what's wrong. But you get that little, why don't you? How come you don't do it now? Well, we shouldn't have that in our minds, and it's none of our business why he's not doing it now. We need to realize that he will in his time. Sometimes it is the manifestation of a way God works. In my weakness, he's shown strong. And the healing that came for me was when I learned to let go and not try to control things. When I let go and quit trying to control, I was healed mentally. And now there is a story and a testimony that would not exist if I wasn't living in my weakness. He's shown strong. Yeah, very much so. And this person says to me, well, it's not that I don't believe in God, but I I don't disbelieve in him either. I know that somebody's there. I really want it to be him, but I'm just not sure. And I said, that's okay. That's okay, because the day will come when there will be no doubt in your mind that the moment you are standing in is God. And you'll feel him and you'll hear him, and that's when you'll be his lock, stock, and barrel, all the way. You'll know, and it, it'll happen. Be patient. Patience is such a hard word to deal with. Being patient. Is your hand raised, Miss Nancy? Yes, I think <laughs> Patience is what I was thinking about. When we realize that we're struggling and we're still struggling, patience isn't something that we can just manufacture for ourselves, it's a fruit that only comes with time. <laughs> There's no other way, and so that's what I was thinking about. The other thing that I was thinking about that's changing the subject a little bit, and maybe we've already touched on it, is how much prophecy there is all through this whole section. Right before he dies, they quote scripture, and they quote scripture, and they quote scripture, which um, if they didn't explain it, we'd never see it. Well, and that was the main reason, you know, uh, for the people of the time that the donkey was chosen was to fulfill the prophecy that he will come and he will be riding on a donkey. That was the main reason was to fulfill that prophecy. But like I said, it was also to show that he was coming in peace. And it was also to show that the type of donkey he was riding was a noble donkey, if that's even possible. It's kind of weird donkeys being what they are. But it was a noble donkey. And the specificity of, of those choices that were made and that, those gears that were all working together to make the trek up to Jerusalem work in, as the well-oiled machine that it was just blow my mind because God works the same way every moment of our lives in us. That the greater is the one, you know, who lives in me. And the same 
person that asks mountains to move, that same power, we hold that power. That same power. And so the same intentionality that is used in Jesus's life is used in ours. And this concept for people, it's, it's hard to, especially if you struggle more than the ordinary family, not that anybody doesn't struggle. Uh, when you live a life of struggle and question and, and everything, this is a hard concept to, to trust in. And I also, she, they, the person said, well, what makes you be able to do this? What makes you be able to believe and have faith in everything you're telling me? And I said, well, how can your faith be that big? And I said, who said my faith is big? Who said it's big? My mother taught me this, you know, from the time I was little. She even has a necklace with a mustard seed in it. The tiniest little seed, I tell you. only thing that's smaller, I think, is carrot seeds. Those things are tiny. The, the faith of a mustard seed is good enough to move that mountain because God says it is. It's, it's our portion. And if we stand in it, God, like Nancy was saying uh, with that patience, it is a fruit, literally. And if you think of a vine, a vine's not going to produce fruit if it's not in the right soil. So when it comes to patience and all these other fruits, we have to tend our garden. That's ourselves, which is what the shack even says, the book, The Shack. Pulling out all the weeds, you know, tilling the soil and planting a new garden. That's that fruit. We have to wait on it and be patient. And that is so hard. And I just sit and think of the time Jesus took to do and fulfill the job that he was brought on this earth to do and his patience and his willingness to tend his garden, spend time with the head gardener and pray with him and, and be at one with him. And for us, this season isn't just about Easter eggs and pastel colors <laughs> and bunny rabbits and chocolate eggs filled with creamy filling and Cadbury bunnies that growl like lions on the TV. It's about Jesus. And I would like to challenge all of us in this coming season towards Easter to ask questions and to try to see the deeper meaning in everything we're being taught. Try to see the duality in what God is, is trying to say. Because don't ever take anything, generally speaking, at face value from our modern day perspective on what God says in the Bible. There's so much, and, and it's like uh, the Dedos. Uh, like to always say, Gary and Kathy Dedo, God is a God of word pictures. That's what the Bible is. It's all written in word pictures, and you can't translate word pictures. The person reading it to you and teaching you from the Bible has to convey that word picture meaning. Otherwise, it's just face value words. And so I challenge all of us in this season to, to do that, to get to know the, the deeper meaning behind the intentionality that God uses to, to get Jesus to Jerusalem, to get him on that cross, to sacrifice his life for us so that we all might live and be here sitting here today uh, and have the power in us to be disciples, to walk in the, the footsteps of the rabbi and live by his example in our own very individual ways because none of us are the same. None of us go the same places. And so the power that is in us, that is Jesus, that is God, is very unique, yet at the same time, it's very the same, if that even makes any sense. It's the same power, but the power that 
Diane has is not the power that I have because I'm Angie and she's Diane. And the power that Curtis has is totally different from hers and mine. But yet at the same time, it's the same power because it's God. So I challenge you guys to do that and uh, ask questions of all of us. Make sure we know what we're talking about.